Hey friends, we are in week three of our look at the Old Testament, just giving a general overview from Genesis all the way um, to Malachi. This week, we're going to be talking about the wisdom books. Let me just give you a look at where we've been. Week one, which all of these are found on our Facebook page um, and also our YouTube channel. Week one, we looked at the Pentateuch, the Genesis to Deuteronomy, first five books of the Old Testament. Week two, we looked at the history books, Joshua through Esther. And then this week, we're going to look at the poetry or more commonly known as the wisdom books. Now, what I've been doing each week is I've been kind of just going along and describing each book and talking about here's the basic information about this book. But this week, we're going to start out with just discussing the topic of, of wisdom and more importantly, like wisdom literature. What does that even mean? So we're going to begin with the definition. Definition of wisdom is the virtue that enables one to make good choices in the complicated circumstances of life in order to walk in a good path. That's the general definition of wisdom. But as followers of Jesus, we're going to describe wisdom as this way. The art of godly living. How are we to live a godly life and to follow Jesus? It can't be based solely upon uh, how we feel or what we think in the moment. There has to be some guiding principles and some wisdom we can learn along the way. Now, wisdom is something that every culture seeks wisdom. And they know that there's a way to live that is right and there's a way to live that is foolish. They know that there's really a way to waste your life and to fizzle your days and just to kind of just waste your time. We're all seeking wisdom, whether it's from friends on social media. Hopefully it's from a book. I like physical books. I don't have one in front of me, but I like physical books. Hopefully it's through listening to podcasts or the radio. But one author describes the search for wisdom this way. Listen to his words. He says, bookstores are jammed full with self-help books offering wisdom to the seeker. Movies and literature are filled with wise characters, Yoda and Gandalf the Grey being some of my favorites. There is never a shortage of gurus being paraded out on the Oprah Winfrey show between her giving away cars, from what I've heard. Usually they are Western dudes dabbling in Eastern philosophy who write books and get paid. I'm going to stop there for a moment, but uh, because a lot of what we think of when we think of Yoda and, and Gandalf the Wise, all of both of those characters and more, they usually promote Eastern uh, philosophy. At a gym I go to, there's a sign where it has Yoda that says, do, do not try. And that would be Eastern uh, philosophy. He continues on to say, ironically, we are people who are surrounded by impressive knowledge, but seem to be prof profoundly lacking in wisdom. Our culture seems to have a deficit of wisdom as we tend to float like empty ballast upon a sea of nothingness. <laughs> he says, I offer MTV's Jersey Shore as humble proof. If you know what Jersey Shore is, I got no word. I'm kidding. But anyway, seriously, how many times can a chick fall in love and give everything she has to some idiot during the course of a summer? So every, <laughs> it's so true. Every culture is seeking after wisdom. What really matters is what, what the wisdom is that they're finding. So I just want to give a few thoughts on wisdom before we jump into looking at some of the wisdom literature in scripture. Now, wisdom for the follower of Jesus grows in us progressively as we walk with God in this world. I want to give you a general principle. Age equals wisdom. Now, this is general because we know some that have a lot of age, but they don't have a lot of wisdom and really vice versa. We see this from uh, Proverbs 20, verse 29, where it says, the glory of young men is their strength. Gray hair, the splendor of the old. It's a very general principle, but I'll have to say when I need wisdom or advice, uh, I have a lot of my peers I go to, but I often go to someone that's lived the life. Maybe that's a retired pastor or uh, just followed Jesus for many years. There's an example of this in uh, 1 Kings 12, where King Rehoboam, he goes to uh, his, he's a young man, he goes to his counselors, which they're usually white haired and um, older, and he asks for their advice, and they tell him to do something, and he, he then ignores it, 
goes to his peers that he grew up with and listens to them. And the end is just devastating. We're not going to go look in the whole story. You can go find it in 1 Kings 12 verses 1 through 11 describe the event. But it's very uh, a very beautiful picture of when you have a group of people that lack wisdom, you're going to them for it. So, there's a paradox of wisdom. You need it most when you are young, but young people do not have it. I'm young. I have to say, when I talk to people that are older than me, um, <laughs> they're like, oh, you're so young. And I'm like, oh man, if I'm young and my back hurts this much, that's bad. But we lack it and we need it. What do we do for careers? How do we raise our kids? And I would say, as, before we go on, I think this is a perfect example of why the Bible describes something. Um, discipleship it is inherently relational, I call it. The New Testament describes, I believe it's Timothy that says, the older teach the younger. And that's a model that we're supposed to have. And what he means by teach is by modeling and not just listen to me talk to you, but model it in front of them. We call them mentors today. But really, discipleship, if we think of the word disciple, it's to teach someone to know God's truth and put it into action. Well, to do that accurately, we need to see it. Andy Stanley has a great description of this. Um, I mess it up every time I describe it, but he pretty much says that he goes from um, him teaching to the other person watching to eventually it gets to he is watching and the other person is teaching. And then the person goes off and can disciple and mentor himself. It's exactly why we're to, as followers of Christ, not live in our little group or our bubble that just has people our own age. But I would say if you're older, myself included, I'm 37, not that old, but I have a mandate to disciple and to raise up and to guide and use the wisdom I have to lead the next generation. Lead corporately, but also lead personally. If you're an introvert, great. One-on-one, -on -one, spend time with people. If you're an extrovert, great. Five or six, spend time with people. Without wisdom as a young person, it leaves us with a difficult choice. Will I learn from the wisdom God has given to others? Or to be very blunt, will I remain an idiot? Idiot in the sense of not knowing. And often, you can only read so many books before you need someone to show you. In our pride, we choose the latter. But if we're willing to humble ourselves, there are several ways that we can grow in wisdom. So let's look at gaining wisdom. Number one, study and listen to the word of God. Over time, we gave the ability to discern good from evil. Hebrews chapter five tells us this. By the constant practicing of being in the word, listening to it taught, being under the, the, the preaching of it, and just studying it ourselves. Number two, heed the words of the wise. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, for lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. And then Proverbs 24 goes on to say, surely you need guidance to wage war and victory is won through many advisors. Same concept, but it goes to the, this is a time frame in which battle was common and these kings, they needed guidance from others. But the next way we learn is we learn the hard way. We do foolish stuff and reap the reality. God is kind and will discipline us as we walk in wisdom, as we grow in wisdom. But we have to do foolish stuff. And we don't go out, get up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to do foolish stuff today. We just set out to grow and to learn and we make mistakes and we learn from them. It, it takes a level of humility to accept that correction God gives you and learn from your mistakes. Examine your mistakes. Spend time on them. So here we go. Wisdom literature in the Bible. Many different genres, genres of literature are found in the scriptures. And I'm just going to read a few of them. There's histories. We went through that. Uh, narratives, poems, law codes, songs, letters, writings about the end of history, parables, covenants, and prophecies declaring God's judgment and actions that's going to happen in the future. All of those different genres make up the scriptures. So if you were going to learn, uh, I had an uncle and he learned English. I think he was master's in English and he took a course on the Bible and the poetry of the Old Testament. There's many different genres. Wisdom literature generally is Job, Psalms, 
Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Others would include the writings of James, it's like chapter one, and talks about if you seek after wisdom, and then uh, also the teachings of Jesus. It just makes sense. He was a pretty smart guy, and God in the flesh. So he's he's very wise. As we go on, these these books, these wisdom literature books. They teach us how God's people are to walk on the earth. Now, many peoples, both ancient and modern, possess a body of wisdom literature. And maybe they don't describe it as that. But they'll, I could say half the self-help books or half the business books or half the whatever books. They're just books that people seek wisdom in. Now, I often, when I read a book, um, I do hesitate. And I, I want to personally read a book from someone that's lived the life. Um, that has gone through the trials, not someone that's discovering it. But at the same time, I do enjoy watching someone learn along the way as I am. What makes biblical writings distinct is their relationship to Jehovah, the God, the, the God who was the creator. If you'll read this quote with me, Old Testament scholar Brooke Walke, he observes that wisdom in scripture exhorts us away from autonomy from God. Proverbs describes it as being wise in your own eyes and living in trusting relationship with God following his paths. We would see that in Proverbs 5 and 6. As we follow Jesus, man, our way is so clear in our own mind, but God's way is so not often how I want it. I want it to be 1, 2, 3, and God's like, nah, let's just do 1, 5, 7, 4, 3. He just works that way. But God at the end goes, oh, I'm glad I didn't just jump from 1 to 3. Though we find wise teaching a great value outside of scripture, and this is kind of a key thought here, the wisdom of the Bible is unique in that it aims, its aims are far beyond just happy lives, getting by like, happily by living on earth. It teaches us how to live within a relationship with God and with other people. Because our lives aren't about us and our lives aren't just to be happy. I like being happy. I'm usually a happy person. But following Jesus, as my wife and I have a saying I've shared with you many times before, we do right not because it's easy. We do right because it's right. And there have been times my wife has reminded me, man, this isn't easy. Oh, well, yeah, but we're not doing it because it's easy. We're doing it because it's right. So those are just some thoughts on seeking wisdom. I do want to take a minute, though, because what does it mean for there to be non-biblical wisdom? To be a Christian, then, does it mean that we only read the Bible and we only study the scriptures and we, we don't read anything else? So worldly wisdom exists in people. There's philosophies, there's religions which flow around us. James describes it, that there's so much wisdom all around us. And there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And we have to understand that. We have to be careful to discern any wisdom given to us. So when... I love reading. Uh, my wife and I are doing a, a reading challenge this year, and uh, she's has her master's in English. She used to teach at the college level, and then there's me who I think got a D in freshman English. Yeah, so there's me. And as we, <laughs> I thought I'd just pick little books, and she's still beating me. She read like a book on Thomas Jefferson that was like 500 pages. My last book was by um, a pastor, and it says just do something, and it was like that big, and she's still ahead. But as I read these books, I'm, I'm learning wisdom. I'm gaining wisdom. But I take that wisdom and I filter it through the scriptures. So as I read Emerson, uh, Emerson, I read uh, his Self-Reliance, the little essays he wrote maybe, I don't know how many years ago, a long time ago. And as I read it, 20 years ago, I would have been like, oh, this isn't right. I would have been all nervous. So I read it now. I'm thinking, well, this, I'm, I'm filtering it through the scriptures. And I'm thinking, well, that's just craziness or that's just, oh, there's, there's a tidbit of truth. I'm going to circle because comparing that to scripture does make sense. Human wisdom is helpful as we've been forged through the furnace and we have the wisdom to discern it. That's why when someone accepts Christ, I encourage them. And we usually have a desire just to get in the word because there's going to be years of you just reading and how you live is going to go and battle in your heart and mind for years. But then you have the foundation to be able to go out and to read other things and to understand other things. 
So let's go into the wisdom literature of scripture. That was just like a precursor to get us thinking what wisdom is, because it's one thing to just say uh, wisdom is to be smart. If you're from Maine, that's how you say it, wicked smart. But wisdom is a little different. Wisdom is how we live our godly life. And I will tell you that sometimes following Jesus isn't doesn't look very smart because God's ways aren't our ways, but they're always best. So let's start out with the book of Job. Job was written uh, by Job. There you go. But he was not an Israelite, and not believed to be. And I didn't even really know this, I have to say, as I was studying. I've read the book of Job many times. But in Ezra 14.14 and 14.20, Ezra describes or mentions Noah, Daniel, and Job. And one commentator said this. He said that righteous, these were righteous folk heroes whom Israel shared with other ancient Near East cultures. Daniel was just the just judge celebrated in Ugaritic literature. So I read this going Noah, Bible, Daniel, Bible, Job, Bible. But there's belief that Noah, okay, Noah is found, the story of Noah, maybe not using his name, but it is also found with his name in some of the um, Near Eastern cultures. Daniel, though, was not the Daniel we think of from the Old Testament, but a different one. And then they're saying this Job was also from Near Eastern cultures. Would have been the same Job, but he's also known outside of Scripture. And this explains the lack of key theological elements. And I never thought of this either, but there isn't the law. There isn't a covenant. There isn't the temple. There isn't any reference to Jehovah at all. He just worships. Like his kids go to eat and they have a feast and he goes afterwards just to ask, give sacrifices because this is a time in which God hadn't given the law yet. It's believed to be the oldest book of the Bible. So God hadn't given much of the law other than there was with Adam and Eve. There was sacrificing that they had to do after the curse and after their sin. So we don't really know who Job was much, but we don't believe he was an Israelite. Job is a dramatic treatment of the problem of suffering of the innocent. Why do good, bad things happen to good people is the, really the question of Job. Um, the breakdown, you can go into any study Bible and look at that, but you have different cycles of speeches given by the three friends and by Job himself. Uh, you have God speaking. That probably would be uh, by my favorite part of the book, chapters 38 and 42. And you have the end where God blesses Job with double what he had to begin with. The major application from Job, there's three of them that you could really get to. Job confronts the problem of human suffering and the sovereignty of God. Take some time and wrestle with the fact that God said to Job, to, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Like, thank you, God. You pointed me out to Satan. If I was Job, I would <laughs> that would have been my first statement. Maybe, probably not. Uh, we learn what God expects from us during suffering, faithfulness. Like just, just be faithful and consistent in what God has for you. And really, Job is the place to go in times of affliction. That is just a go-to book. Read through it. Um, I love the friends. They just start with, like throwing Job under the bus after sitting and listening. Then they open their mouth. And after that, it was just a mess. And while suffering is a th th chief theme of the book, no answer is given. We learn what God expects from us, but he doesn't give us an answer in return. He just says, I'm God. And I know you, Job. He knows us. And he cares for us, but he doesn't explain himself. The next book is the book of Psalms. There's a lot of them. It's the largest book um, in the Old Testament. And the overview here, just it's a collection of poetry, prayers, and hymns that focus the worshiper's thoughts on God in praise and adoration. Multiple authors. We have David writing, um, I put Psalm 73. That's supposed to say 73 Psalms. But we see David and others, uh, some attributed to Moses. Parts of the book were, um, were used for worship, a hymnal. That's why the word Psalm in the Greek means a song sung to the accompaniment of a musical instrument. Some key scriptures I want to just mention. Psalm 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. 
Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The King James says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as a kid, I remember thinking, like, if he's my shepherd, why don't I want him? But it's, I shall not be in want. I shall not be lacking for anything. And then Psalm 51, 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, or renew a steadfast spirit within me. And these are just some key verses. You could probably start listing the ones that you know. Um, some I know there's one that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And you just go on and on of all these scriptures, Proverbs 3. That's Proverbs, but never mind. There's a lot of them. I'm going to say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. The outline would be very simple. There's part 1, Psalm uh, 1 through 41. Part 2, Psalms 42 through 72. Psalms 3, Psalm, uh, part 3, Psalm 70 through 89, part 4, 90 to 106, and part 5, Psalm 107 to 150. And the summary, it's hard to summarize the entire psalm, I have to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, it describes with great detail the problem of humanity. It's a place to run when we're hurting. Suffering is with Job. This is just to go because you see David especially. He just bears his heart. Over and over again, there's a pattern of him bearing his heart, kind of being pretty blunt. We might call it complaining, but in the end, he rests in God's faithfulness and goodness. And really, that's all we have to trust on. We can we can trust in this, the process. We can trust on our plans. But then in the end, we just have to trust that God is going to lead us and guide us and be faithful. The next book is the book of Proverbs. An overview. It's one of the most cherished and most read books of the Bible, um, especially with wisdom literature. I had a college professor who said every day, and he was oh, in his 40s then, he said every day I read um, one Proverbs every single day. There's 30, um, 31, no, 30, 30 chapters. 31 days always throws me off. You just have to read one twice. It's a collection of sayings from various people, most likely compiled by King Solomon, who reigned from 971 to 931. We see that Solomon was a person God gave wisdom and understanding. And in 1 Kings, it tells us that he collected over 3,000 Proverbs, wrote them or collected, and over 1,000 songs. Proverbs is part of that. It's a way of showing us God's wisdom for a happy life. It is happy to follow Jesus. Just remember that's not the center of our lives. And it's one of the most practical books. It's very simple and easy to follow and to learn from. I want to give this outline because I have struggled over the years trying to really um, logically break down the Proverbs because I, I like things one, two, three, four. I like to look for patterns and systems. So chapters one through nine, we have the value of seeking wisdom. Chapters 10 to 22, the Proverbs of Solomon. The collected sayings of Solomon, chapters 25 to 29, and then the sayings of Agur and Lemuel in chapters 30 and 31. Wow, embarrassed. There are 30 chapters. There's a lot of chapters. I get that mixed up. Ever since I was in college in Old Testament class, having to tell you that answer. I get it wrong to this day. To summarize it, Proverbs is a good choice when you're looking for the timeless truth that's easy to understand and apply for your life. You look in there and it just gives you timeless truths that one of them um, talks about if you want to have friends, you have to make yourself friendly. Boom. Simple. I say that to my kids all the time when they're fighting. Be friendly and you'll make friends. Timeless truth that's consistent from then all the way to today. After we leave Proverbs, we go into two more books. And one, we have a whole series online on our YouTube channel you can find. Uh, Pastor Bruce uh, went through the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know how many years ago, uh, but it should be on their archive somewhere. And then after that is Song of Solomon, um, which or Song of Songs. We'll look at Ecclesiastes. It's Solomon's unique approach to the pursuit of wisdom. The author is the preacher. He describes himself who wrote, gathered, and assembled written words of wisdom. Um, and he grapples with this age-old riddle. What advantage does man have in all his work, which he does under the sun? What's the point? To make a paycheck? Just to build something or do something? I would say the key verse is the next verse. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. 
And then one other key verse you can find at the end where it says, um, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, kind of summarizing it all. But the whole book is really grappling with what's the point? So what? You're kind of sitting here melancholy, like, all right, life's getting kind of boring. So what? Ecclesiastes is it. A quick outline. We have the problem in chapter one. He explores the problem in chapters uh, one, verse 12 through chapter eight. He explains life in the hand of God and how really God is in control of all things, chapters 9 through 12, and then the conclusion in chapter 12, just a few verses, that verse I quoted earlier. Application. Success in life, we discover, can be found online, can be found in a right relationship with God. I don't know why the word online is there. Success in life might be found online, but only in a right relationship with God. If you don't like the computer, don't worry. It's not definitely online. To find wisdom that will keep you from ruining your life, turn to Ecclesiastes. And uh, that might be a harsh thing to say, but I don't know about you, but I can ruin my life pretty easily. Just a couple foolish mistakes, boom, I'm done. The last book, uh, at least in my experience, is probably the book I've studied the least, is the uh, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. It's a touching portrait of love and affection within marriage. It's a ballad of love and longing. It's an exchange of love notes. It's a story of adoration, satisfaction, delight, and desire. And the key verse uh, one often says is chapter 7, verse 10, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. As you read this, some of the, some of the language is kind of funny. It describes um, his, his woman's hair as a herd of goats. Um, but, you know, He's just taking what he sees and just describing it. But it is a beautiful picture of love in marriage. Interestingly, though, God is never mentioned directly in the original Hebrew. He alludes to it, but we don't see God. It's one of those books. There's only a few of them that don't mention him. But it does show us how God designed marriage to be and how it should be enjoyed and how intimacy in marriage is a natural thing. And a side note, if intimacy, often as I talk to couples and as I read books on this, um, Intimacy, when it's not there, it's a sign that there's something going on in your marriage. It should be a healthy part of your relationship. So this thing God gave it to us. And the Old Testament even told us to be fruitful and multiply. So it's a part of our life that we're supposed to be enjoying. Just an outline. Uh, we have a wet preparation for a wedding. The couple profess their desire and love for each other in chapters four and five. And then both united in love in chapters six to eight. Application, go to Song of Solomon to learn about the type of relationship every couple should strive for in marriage. You should long for your spouse as we have this couple longing for each other. Now, I promise you, side note, you might be like, yeah, well, my spouse has this or this, or it looks like this and this. Yeah, well, I bet if we saw these individuals, we'd be like, oh, okay. So there's that excuse. Gone. As we look at the wisdom books, there, um, there's, you could spend your whole life, and I hope you do spend your whole life, just studying them in addition to other parts of the scriptures. But if there's one of them you're not familiar with, uh, I would encourage you to take some time and to read it and to grow in it. And you can understand a little bit more about how God wants you to live, those, those principles, those um, timeless truths that we can apply to our lives. Next week, or part four of this series, we're going to be looking at all the prophets. Again, it's going to be very high level uh, because we're going to look at them all. So I would encourage you to join with us. It'll be online. In addition, um, I'll be teaching at a Kittery Point um, on the 16th, Wednesday the 16th, if you'd like to join us. So God bless, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.